The title, as you know, is uh, uh, Five Projects. I wonder if uh, you uh, have question, why five projects, not four, not six, and so on. I think the issue here is how a project is defined. If you know about the Chinese practice, um, you know, the Chinese architectural practice, and most offices would easily have a uh, uh, lot more than five uh, projects, would, uh, would uh, double this number, triple, and so on. So for me, however, for our office, a project is defined by a research agenda. So a design without an agenda is it, just production. And, and then a project with a research, a research agenda, and then it becomes something meaningful. That's very important. So I, I went through the projects we are, are doing right now in our office. So there are five projects that I believe not only they have a different uh, um, research agendas, but also that uh, these projects could in some way summarize uh, together the, uh, uh, all the, the, the concerns we have uh, towards the conditions of China today in terms of architecture and city and of course uh, urbanization in general. So the first project could, uh, actually, could we have the lights down a bit, at least in front? Yeah, thank you. The first project is the uh, ISM project. ISM as in capitalism or uh, materialism and so on, is about ideology. So there's uh, one uh, uh, ISM, it's actually a rather complicated one, is the socialist realism. That one has become something uh, I'm, I'm uh, very much inter interested in. Um, I, I actually, probably I should say it uh, in Chinese just for the Chinese students so that uh, they have a um, better understanding of what I'm talking about here. It's a Shi Hui Xian Shi Zhu Yi. That sounds pretty much like Chinese down there. So anyway, uh, let me show you a building and then you know what I'm talking about. So this is the uh, railway station in the city of uh, Changsha. So if you, you uh, know the story of the building and you would uh, pay attention, see if uh, I can, I'm sorry, I should go back. Uh, to the, uh, just to the tip uh, of this particular building. This is a, a black and white image so that uh, you uh, wouldn't know the color of that little ornament on the top of the building is red. So it was a torch. It's a, a, a revolutionary uh, icon. So when it was first designed, there was a, a story, but I think it was uh, a true. And there was a, 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 some difficulty to decide the direction of the torch. And it was meant to have the tip of the flames towards the west, because the message is all about the eastern wind would overwhelm the western wind. However, and then there was a potential misreading of it. So people would think they are advised to pay more attention to the West. And then they turned it around, of course, and then that was also the wrong message. And they tried every different directions. The only way to make that politically correct is to make the flame to go up. Um, so this building was one of the very first ones to receive a nickname. Now every building, major buildings in, in China um, would have a nickname. So this one is called the Little Red Pepper because it doesn't look like a, a, a flame at all, a torch. 
And in that region, the region of uh, the province of Hunan, they eat a lot of uh, peppers anyway. So, however, the interesting thing is, architecturally speaking, if you take that thing, whatever that might be, away, and what do we have? Is, is something actually would, would uh, resemble Western classical architecture. Uh, I, I think that's uh, um, fairly obvi uh, obvious. And then you see the, uh, uh, the notion of harmony, you see the notion of a balance, and of course, more specifically, and then you see symmetry, you see the, the axis and so on, they're all there. And then the question here is, where did this kind of architecture come from? Uh, because it's not Chinese. Uh, it came from, partly it came from here, from uh, Soviet Union. This is the uh, um, University of uh, Moscow. And it was built in such a way. And then again, you can see the uh, political icons and here and there. Um, the, the, the star on, on, on the top, and so on. Again, and this, is, oh, this was rather an effort to, uh, to uh, uh, turn the uh, kind of uh, uh, European uh, classicism into a different uh, uh, style of architecture to make a point ideologically. So that was under the regime of Stalin. So, uh, uh, and so that was called uh, socialist uh, uh, realism. So, and then if we uh, trace back, um, I, I should have a, a, an image of uh, um, classical architecture in, in Italy, just for uh, this occasion. I'm sorry that I have one rather uh, in Berlin. Uh, but as you can see, again, the point is uh, uh, pretty uh, straightforward. So uh, although there was a totally different ideology embraced by socialist realism, but it is essentially so. So anyway, back in China, so you can see from the, uh, uh, the Shinko, that's the name of the architect, Carl Friedrich Shinko's old museum in Berlin, now back to the, uh, now it's called National Museum of China on the Tiananmen Square. So you can see the resemblance. So the, the ideological message was consistent. What's interesting was that after a while, um, again, it was influenced from Russia. However, with a different message because Stalin thought it was very important to show the rest of Europe that the kind of architecture in Russia, in the Soviet Union, was different. Ideological symbols were not enough, so uh, he also promoted uh, uh, doing uh, architecture with some original uh, um, touch. And so on. he sent experts from Russia to China and, and in China, these Russian experts also promoted doing um, modern architecture at that time uh, you know, for China uh, with these little hats of uh, traditional uh, architecture. So this is just another version of socialist realism. And then it got other variations as well. And this one, it looks uh, quite uh, uh, classical, actually. But if you look at the, the closely the decor, and, and actually uh, there is a, a kind of a, a art deco flavor to it, you know, with all these uh, decorations, uh, and it's uh, based on Chinese uh, um, uh, mythologies and, and, and the fable and so on. So actually, the, these three buildings, uh, the reason I know them pretty well, they're all in Beijing. They were all designed by my father, who's an architect. Uh, so, so that's one story, the story of the socialist realism. Meanwhile, meaning in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, internationally, there was another movement going on, the one of the brutalism. 
I think what's important about brutalist architecture is about its origin. It started in India. This is Chandigarh in India. And this is a governmental uh, building designed by the Swiss French architect Le Corbusier. The reason he started doing this kind of architecture because the level of construction technology was very low. So basically today I believe that in many parts of India, um, buildings are built with women only usually and ha have uh, buckets of materials, rebels, cement, whatever it is uh, uh, over their heads. And with that kind of a technology, you know, uh, and Le Corbusier discovered a totally different expression of architecture, especially in concrete. So here you see uh, you know, one of the buildings they built in, in the 50s uh, in, in India. So the rough, very rough kind of a concrete um, became a, a very different expression of architecture. And then Corbu brought it back to Europe and th this is uh, the uh, uh, Habitation, uh, Unité Habitation uh, in, uh, um, in uh, Mar Marseille. Uh, um, so uh, here, um, it is not because of the, the technology, but, but rather because of uh, the artistic expression of the rough textured uh, um, concrete. And, and, and so it became uh, uh, for me, uh, uh, less powerful. And then the true uh, celebration of brutalism happened in Brazil, in Latin America. This is, by the way, the work of an Italian architect. Her name is Lina Bobardi. She went to uh, Brazil and discovered also the same thing as Corbu did in uh, India and, and the, the, you know, the workmanship in, in uh, Brazil could be very low and she also found a, a very different uh, expression in architecture with this rather crude uh, uh, concrete. So my interest has been for a while is to marry these two things. Socialist um, uh, realism on one hand and then brutalism on the other. So I found actually a precedent, which is uh, I could uh, uh, suggest, if I may, uh, something called uh, brutalist uh, classicism, not socialist uh, realism. So there's a lot of isms. I don't think you need to remember. Uh, but the point is this. This particular painter, his name is Lucien Floyd the grandson of the famous uh, uh, psychologist. And, uh, and uh, he uh, painted paintings uh, li like the one showing in the image. And what's interesting is that when you look at the image, the painting, and apparently he was using the technique of traditional classical paintings, but yet, he was not producing the beauty of classical paintings at all, but he was trying to confront a kind of a humanity of the contemporary person. In this case, as, as uh, in, he did in, in many uh, paintings, uh, even uh, uh, may, maybe a, a obese uh, person, you know, uh, 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 you know people are, are very big. So, so there's something very, very brutal, perhaps, about uh, his painting, which inspired me to try to uh, combine the classicism or the socialist um, realism with uh, uh, brutalism. So here is one of our projects. So we were commissioned to design a museum for the Cultural Revolution period. Um, officially today, we cannot really name the, the museum as such, so we have to, to be a little uh, uh, subtle about it. So that's why you see uh, is that a particular decade in our history, uh, rather than, than just a, a direct uh, uh, cultural revolution as being the name here. 
and then it is a bridge as well as a museum so that uh, uh, the building also um, has a nickname which is a, a, a bridge museum. It's in the city of uh, Anren and, and the province of Sichuan. Uh, here is our building. So I wish uh, it's, it's evident that you can see the classical spirit behind it and even maybe a traditional Chinese big roof is still there. And, and however, uh, more specifically, and then you, uh, you can see there are like three horizontal layers to the architecture, a base which is missing, and I'll talk about that, and then you see the body of the building, and then there is a clearly defined top. And here is a set of architecture drawings, and then so you can get a, a good idea how the bridge works. And so basically, the museum is sandwiched between the bridge and the roof terrace. So there, there is uh, uh, the classical notion of defining the bottom and top and the middle uh, of uh, a building. But meanwhile, and there are also a different way of treating the bottom. In this case, it's an underbridge space. So it becomes a, a rather uh, uh, unstable stability for such a building. So we try to take the heritage of socialist realism while we like to question it and undermine it from time to time. So here is uh, the two uh, sections and the uh, uh, floor plan of uh, the underbridge space and then the museum per se above the bridge and the roof terrace. So back to the photographs. So you can see it's a bridge, uh, it's not very clearly on, on the screen, and, and it's spanning over a river. And here is a broader side of the bridge which serve not only to says the bridge, but in a way it's a continuation of the streets on both sides of the river. And then you see a staircase will take you up to the, uh, um, the roof terrace. And this is a closer look of it. So we use three materials. One is concrete, which is visible here. The second one is river pebble. Because there's a ri river, there's a lot of uh, uh, river pebbles for the construction. And then the third material, which you really don't see directly, but it's there. It's actually, it's bamboo. We put bamboo in the foam work for pouring concrete so that you see the imprint of this very local material also being part of the surface of the finished building. So the bamboo is not there, but it is present at the same time. And then here is, is towards the other side of the bridge. And then on, on the uh, roof. Uh, eventually, the uh, owner of this project, who's uh, one of the, the biggest collectors of artifacts from the uh, Cultural Revolution period in our history, and he collects things from uh, also uh, World War II and, and other periods as well. So he has currently about uh, 8 million pieces of artifacts in his collection. So his plan here is to put uh, statues on top of all these uh, pedestals. And then uh, the interior right now is, is still unfinished because uh, again the uh, owner is planning uh, the uh, uh, um, what was put in the, uh, what, what he uh, would like to put in there and also the installation and so on. So uh, we're waiting for him to come up uh, with uh, the, uh, um, the ideas for the exhibition. But however, you can see the quality of the interior space as well as the quality of light. The light would bring out again these very rough textures of concrete 
and in a way to really bring the presence again into history, or we, we wish that would be the case. And underneath the bridge, and you see the river, and then you see these uh, slanted columns. So from the expression of the classicism, also we like to see a triumph of the infrastructure today. So it is a museum, but also it, it's a bridge. I think the combination of the two maybe would have gave uh, um, the architecture, especially this particular space, also another kind of uh, 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 monumentality, uh, which is uh, one of uh, almost like a cathedral in the West. And then you can, you can uh, um, see another image of it. Uh, eventually, there's going to be a, a tea house. What you're looking at also is a stage. So you can sit there and uh, drinking tea and, and watch people singing uh, um, revolutionary songs. Um, because uh, the client uh, loves to do that himself. He, he's, he's a very kind of unusual personality. And once we we're doing a, a meeting in the middle of it, he, st he stood up uh, on the table, just started to sing. But he, he's such a perfectly uh, uh, otherwise uh, uh, um, sane person, so he's not crazy, but, but he's probably pretty crazy anyway. Um, so anyway, so that's just one, one building. What we're really trying to do, uh, as you can see here, um, we're trying to make a bridge, not only to bridge the two sides, the two banks of a river, we're trying to bridge our time, the architecture of the 21st century back into our, our history. It's very important to remember that architecture is very much anchored into the land. So I don't believe that we can actually uh, uh, ship uh, architecture from other places and, and still to, to make a, a, a valid uh, uh, argument and make our, our lively uh, presence, although that seems to happen in, in, in a rather a big uh, uh, um, scale um, in China. So anyway, so the first project, uh, it is about ideology, it is about history actually uh, in our minds. And also, of course, in the history, in, in the, it's about tradition. So that's, um, again, you see the bridge and actually from, from afar. So in our office, we have been trying to, to deal with uh, this uh, uh, issue of uh, tradition. It's not so much about preservation, which I think it takes some experts to deal with some very sensitive uh, um, uh, issues in, in the city, in you know, Beijing or, or elsewhere. So what I have been interested in is that within this kind of architecture, there is a particular lifestyle. Is that lifestyle today still possible? Do we still want to live that way or rather not? I think at least we need to have options. You may or may not, uh, today especially, afford to live in a courtyard house like this. But the idea of living uh, in a house like this, as you see here, is uh, very uh, uh, um, clear. This photograph was not taken in the 50s or 60s. This is probably five years ago. An architect photographer um, from uh, Portugal came to Beijing, a friend of mine, and took the photograph, and not very long before the house was uh, demolished. So there is uh, 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 this lifestyle, as you can see, people would be able to enjoy not only the interior of the buildings, but having this outdoor, really, living space. So he could uh, play with the birds and have all the, uh, the plants and have tea and, and have a c cigarette as he, he would wish. So we tried that before and it's a still continuing effort. 
So here, uh, perhaps, it's not a, about uh, ism, but it's about tradition. So this courtyard house is not in the city, so we don't believe it has to be to totally uh, 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 introverted, but rather it's half of a piece uh, you know, of, our, uh, of architecture, the other half is rather a piece of nature together making an outdoor living space, which is the courtyard. So also you can see when you embrace the nature uh, as such, you know, with buildings so that you can uh, save uh, the trees on the site. So we started by, by imagining a, a house this, uh, as um, uh, uh, consolidated, and then we split the house open to uh, to create this order space in the middle. So that's why uh, the house was named uh, uh, Split House eventually. And uh, and and as you can see uh, here is a courtyard in the back, and that's the front of the house. And then of course, the uh, construction technology here is ram earth and we had to uh, uh, relearn it. it. It's kind of a, uh, um, it's not kind of, a, actually it was lost, and the construction team wouldn't be able to, uh, they, they, they just didn't know how to do it. So we learned uh, ourselves, and then we, we made uh, uh, many uh, sample pieces, you know, uh, experiments, and then we uh, taught the construction workers to do it. Here is the entry. So, and the, the, the living space. And so wood and, and uh, earth are the traditional materials and we, uh, China, used for centuries. But here, they are not used in the traditional way, but it's to, to uh, uh, recreate a kind of a lifestyle that is connected to the history, but yet is also contemporary. So we, we already started to, to uh, discuss the notion of material. So here, mat is for material. So this is also a very important project. So from the uh, uh, ISM project to mat project, the concern only is shifted a little towards technology. And I'd like to show you one project with uh, rather traditional material. Traditional, in a sense, is a material we have been using already over a century. And I'm talking about glass. Um, Audi, uh, as you know, uh, the one, one of the German uh, car makers, approached us to design something to display a car. So of course, you have to see the car. But for me, a car sitting there not moving is not interesting at all, because car is about speed and so on. I, I think uh, in uh, Italy, of course, you all know that very well. And uh, driving in, in, in Milan and other Italian cities is quite an adventure, although we are now catching up uh, in, in China with the Italians. Um, so anyway, so what we decided to do is this. So we have the car we have all these glass around it, and then there's something interesting happens. So because it, it's, as architects, uh, we, we think that uh, everything we design is a house. So here is a house for uh, the car. And it's something like this. So it's not a, a great uh, discovery, but we notice that glass is a material, so it is transparent, but it is always there. So as a material, so it has other properties besides being transparent. One of them is reflection. So with reflection, so here actually, of course, you see the car in, in its entirety. And here with reflections, I hope that you started to see movement. So it's uh, rather the illusion of movement generated by uh, this particular material glass. 
So the project for us is a study, uh, a, a research or experiment of using the material glass in such a way that it is no longer only the uh, notion of uh, transparency and you know, written by great scholars like Colin Rowe and also uh, entertained by many architects from East Van der Rohe to Philip Johnson and so on. And another image of a car which is not moving but looks like it is. And so um, that's that. Uh, of course, and then you see uh, how glass would have uh, a formal expression in its own right. And, and the next project is still ongoing. It's about using a composite material. And it relates back to my uh, research at, at MIT. I'm actually teaching currently a studio uh, about uh, uh, fiber reinforced polymer. Uh, it's just a fancier name for uh, fiberglass. And, uh, uh, and uh, of course, at MIT, uh, we're able to really push it much further. But in, in uh, reality, in China, so we're doing a, a more low-tech version of it. Uh, fiberglass is a material which is widely used. If uh, you happen to have a, a yacht, I, I don't know if everyone has a yacht, probably not. Uh, it would have most likely made, be made of uh, fiberglass. It's very strong, but very light. And then if you go to China, you see a lot of uh, sculptures in the city. There's a coat of something on the surface, such as bronze, for instance. But underneath it is, is usually also fiberglass. So fiberglass is a material very widely used for all different purposes, for some good reasons. So one of them, as I said, is very strong. The other one is very light. So we like to see if this material could be used for the structure of a house. So we did all this uh, research. So I can go through them very quickly for you. One is about the strength ratio to the weight. So as you can see there in the bar, so basically, uh, either you say fiberglass is six times stronger than steel, or rather you say the weight of fiberglass is six times lighter than steel, which is the same thing. And then we studied uh, the uh, production of it. You can see the columns or the studs on the upper uh, roll of images has been extruded. And then on the, on the bottom is another very commonly used technology. In this case, we use that to produce floor plates. It's called vacuum uh, injection. Very, very simple. You suck the air out from one side to allow the uh, polymer and fiber to flow in from the other side. So that technology is used for making floor plates and the other extrusion uh, is used for making uh, tubes. And then uh, we are always collaborating. As again, uh, Mr. Rector said uh, um, in, in his uh, remarks, and we also are trying to really collaborate with people from other disciplines, especially people from engineering. And so here uh, we're doing, uh, well, I, I say we, it doesn't mean architects, more we are watching maybe, it's a better word. So we are watching the engineers doing all these uh, uh, very important uh, structural tests to testing the load distribution and to see uh, how the structural system would uh, take horizontal forces. And then here is our job as architects. We developed a very simple joint to hold everything together. So the joint itself is made of uh, steel. So let, okay, here, here you go. So you can see. So you can fit the fiberglass tubes onto it, and also it would hold a, a piece of a, a floor plate. So it's something like this. Not high-tech. It's a new material, but it's done in, in a 
pretty uh, simple or rather almost primitive way, putting together the whole uh, building system, adding the, the structural elements for uh, taking the shear forces and so on. And to fit it onto the site, the buildings have very uh, shallow depths for uh, natural ventilation as well as uh, um, better light and better views looking out. It's in the city of Nanjing, in a very uh, scenic area. Uh, so, uh, so the view uh, is, is very important. So I'm just gonna go quickly through uh, these set of drawings. And uh, uh, it's, it's a, a big house for the, uh, people to spend time uh, on the weekends. So the house can be used for one big family or shared by several. And that's how the house would look like. Now, we are still working on some uh, uh, tests. One is about the aging of uh, fiberglass. So that's uh, pretty much the final issue we need to resolve. We resolve the fire issues and so on. So I'm not gonna go into some of the, the very uh, technical aspects uh, of this project, but if you're interested, so come over after lecture so we can, we can chat about them. So that's how the building would look like eventually. And these are uh, yet another test uh, we did for the structure. So you can see how the upper level of these tubes are fitting onto the joint. And then so basically uh, makes a, a fragment of the two-story uh, structure. And then the load came and put on top of the building and then we, we uh, were collecting all kinds of data. So the point here is not so much about this particular design. As I said early on, it's actually it's not terribly advanced, but the point is technology is really part of architecture today. Architects have to work with engineers and scientists together really produce a different kind of architecture. It's the way we work, the methods uh, of working we have, that becomes something uh, it's been already challenged and then we have to change. In our office, we make a conscious effort to do just that. So there are, again, just another installation in, in a gallery uh, in Beijing. And then you can see uh, uh, our, our structural uh, sample being fitted into uh, the, uh, the, the art gallery. And then you see the material close up. What's interesting is that I wondered when the Greeks built their stone temples, not only that they uh, imitated the form of a wooden structure, possibly they didn't really like stone as much. That was available material for them. They used it. After a while, they discovered the beauty of stone. I'm, I'm really butchering the history of it's, it's uh, really, really wrong. The history professor should correct what I, I'm saying here, uh, maybe tomorrow. Um, but however, what's interesting is that when we started to work with fiberglass, I actually, I thought it looked pretty ugly. And after a while, and then after looking at the fiberglass tube for so long that we started to see also the beauty in, in the material. So that's the mat story. The second one uh, is, of course, super important. Maybe it's, it, it is the most important one after all. It's the one about the city, uh, urban uh, for, for urban, the urban project. We are doing uh, one urban project right now um, in the city of Shanghai in this uh, uh, district called Jading. Uh, it's used initially was programmed to use uh, uh, to be used as a uh, um, um, creative industry uh, industrial base. It's really it's like a, an office park which we really, really question because for us, 
uh, an industrial park uh, is really a dead end for uh, urban development because people only work there. They have to live somewhere else and go to a third place to shop. It's a kind of a urbanism, of course, uh, originally generated in, in the United States and it was imported to many countries and including China, which was totally, absolutely unsustainable. Too much energy and too much time uh, uh, in the car on the road so that uh, people don't get a chance to enjoy life and they don't get a chance to meet each other and so on. So with this project, we actually proposed a totally different question. We wondered if we could design a town instead. Not an office park, but a livable township. And then we studied all the problems we have uh, in, in uh, uh, the new uh, uh, Chinese city, although this one uh, is taken from uh, uh, Xuhui, uh, Qu, uh, Xuhui district in Shanghai. It's not really new, but everything we see uh, pretty much uh, uh, um, is, is pretty uh, recent. And uh, unfortunately, you, you get to see all the problems we're having in the city. We see a lot of cars, very, very wide roads. They're not streets. And then you see a landscape as decoration. It's not a park. You can't go in there and do your Tai Chi in the morning because it's just too, uh, too dangerous. You're going to run over by all these cars. And, and then if you look at all these buildings, you know, they're pretty chaotic. They don't really uh, um, make uh, uh, the urban fabric together. And then you see a few people on the, uh, on the far uh, uh, right, right side for you. You see a few people on the bicycle. You don't see one single pedestrian in this image. So can you imagine the quality of life? Uh, yeah, here uh, you see some people. So, and then on the other hand, uh, there are places like this. This is not Disneyland. People still living like this. You can see the laundries and so on. So for us, it's not going back to this. I, I, you know, we all understand that's not possible either. But maybe there is something in between. We don't have to choose between these two. But maybe we we'll, can come up uh, with something uh, different, however, with the central theme of livability. So what we did in the end is very limited and very simple, but I hope it's uh, also very effective. This is on, on your uh, left, is, is a typical uh, new uh, Chinese urban block. The smallest size would be 400 by 400 meters. Uh, it's actually it's pretty much a rarity. Usually you would find something more on the 50, I'm sorry, five to 600 meters by, by five to, to 600 meters. So that it's only good for making gated community. If you enclose the community and that's the kind of a size you would want. It means that it really started to gut out a city so that uh, uh, there's not much of uh, urbanity left. That's why you need to drive from place to place. So after a lot of um, studies, we decided on a 40 by 40 meter block so that there are more interface between the buildings and the streets. And then we hope that, and then we also designed the street in such a way that there is a, always a covered walkway, rather like uh, in, in the city of uh, 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 some Italian cities, especially like uh, Bologna. So ever you go, there's a colonnade. It makes a lot of sense. Maybe it's old fashioned, but we don't care because we think that would help with the livability of the city. And so that, and it's a much more intimate city with a connected system for the, for the pedestrians. And then we studied, again, something would be very familiar by, uh, um, by you, uh, you know, by, because uh, it was something uh, probably uh, started uh, in Europe, 
is the notion of periphery um, block or, or perimeter uh, block. And, and uh, um, see, uh, you can see a very simple uh, development of it. And then the different organizations of the interior spaces. So we came up with all these uh, different uh, variations of spatial organizations for, for uh, different blocks. And the one on the bottom is one uh, uh, also we experienced quite a, quite a, a crisis. Okay, here, here we go. And after we designed the building on uh, these rather four blocks, the uh, density doubled and our client decided they wanted to build something much bigger there. So what we did, as you can see, we did two cities. The city with mini blocks is still there on the ground level. And then there's a floating, floating city on the top. So that was our solution. The city on the top actually is a hotel. And then we have conference facilities and also athletic facilities and the, the, the supporting facilities for the hotel on the uh, lower level. So that's the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know, we could say master plan for, uh, for um, this uh, park or rather in the end we hope it's gonna be a town. And, and uh, we did the master plan actually for a much bigger area, but all these 22 blocks were uh, designed architecturally by also FCJZ. And we uh, designed the, uh, uh, the streets. This is a shared street. Uh, the notion is from Holland. Um, it's about how cars uh, and, and the pedestrians could, could uh, use uh, the streets together by having the cars slowing down. Uh, through this uh, meandering path. And then reincorporating the canal. And there's a different facades of the building. And now the, uh, the one with the hotel, the four blocks actually is close to completion. So you can see uh, the uh, hotel rooms are above and then the mini blocks underneath. So the project, uh, will we'll continue uh, its construction uh, this year. So the other 18 blocks will, will break ground actually fairly soon. So right now we're wor working on the uh, landscape uh, for uh, this, this particular group of blocks and then the, the hotel rooms on top with another layer of landscape between the mini blocks and the, the hotel rooms. A detail of the materials, we were using uh, glass blocks to create uh, a veneer between the balconies and hotel rooms and also the city. So that was the most serious part of the talk. Now we're getting into something uh, little uh, more, uh, probably quite light-hearted. So, um, as you know, uh, in Italy very well, there is a tradition for architects not only to uh, design buildings, but design also products, of course, furniture, and so on. So we have a lot of great masters, such as Mandini, the, the name uh, Sassas, goes on and on and on. Um, well, uh, of course, you know, I, I, I'm not from that tradition, but it happens that now there are such opportunities in China uh, for our office to go into uh, these different fields. So alt is about doing alternative practice. It has been uh, a very, very uh, interesting one. In fact, that was just another reason for me to be in uh, Milan um, right now because uh, some of our uh, product designs are, are being displayed in an exhibition during the uh, Milan Design Week. So um, what this is, uh, it's a tray for uh, Alessi, uh, as you all know, an Italian company. 
So um, I was trying to come up with uh, an idea uh, for a tray design. It proved to be very difficult, not as what I thought at all. So after struggling for more than a year, I saw the tray. Uh, our office is in the uh, old summer palace in, in Beijing. Uh, in Chinese, it's called Yuan Ming Yuan. And then, uh, so in front of our office, we have this beautiful uh, uh, lotus. And, and uh, probably it wasn't uh, uh, legal, but we picked a leaf from the pond anyway. And, and, and we were observing how it was uh, drying. So at one point, I thought, see, that's a tray. The tray, of course, is not designed by us, but rather designed by the nature. Uh, and um, it also means that um, if uh, already there is uh, something that could be used uh, functionally as a new tensile, and then we don't have to design. So looking at it more, and then digitally we scan that particular leaf. And after the scanning, we adjust the digital model, model only slightly so that it could sit on a flat surface. And that, that, that was it. So um, I was talking about collaboration. In this case, I believe that our collaborator is God. So nature and uh, FCJC together produce this tray. For that reason, maybe, and now it's a best seller uh, with uh, uh, Alessi's other products. So he's, here is a stainless steel tray, um, which can be used uh, uh, from uh, both sides. So that was a lotus leaf. Now it comes some uh, gourds in Chinese called hulu. Again, a beautiful design by the nature or, or by, the, by God. Uh, and then we took the idea from this beautiful utensil. Uh, it's, it's, of course, a long tradition, especially in the northern part of China. So you would harvest these uh, gourds and then you cut them in, in half, and then you, you clear the inside of it. It became a, a utensil. It's waterproof. You can use it to scoop water or rice or, or flour, whatever. And then you can also use it as a bowl to keep some fruits and, and you know, whatever objects. So we got that idea from the nature, and then we designed these chinaware, uh, dinnerware. So the idea is that we digitally construct a hulu and then slice it into uh, plates and, and bowls. The little ones are for a person to use. So you can have uh, um, rice and soup and you can have uh, um, di different dishes put in them, and the bigger ones are for serving. And, and uh, I don't know if they still are, but they were available uh, in the Italian market. Actually, uh, we, we came up with a very Italian name for uh, the, the ones we did for Italy. They were called Ciao Hulu. I don't know. It doesn't sound, <laughs> it sounds like it's kind of uh, silly. But anyway, the point was that we reconfigured it in such a way that you can have a big piece of steak, you can have a whole pile of a pasta, I guess. So it's a different size uh, than the ones we designed for, for China. And then together they could create a, a table escape as such. And then after the big hulus, and then uh, we uh, produce little ones to have sauce and, and other things and you see how they are being used. And then when you eat, you have to drink. And then we uh, did a decanter. Actually, we did two. 
this one is for a European wine, and also we did one for a rice wine. And this is for uh, olive oil and, and uh, vinegar, so for salad. So that, that was the alternative project. Maybe in our mind, we are very much aware of the fact Chinese economy is a bubble after all. It's going to burst. So by that time, probably we wouldn't have any commissions to, to uh, build buildings. Well, what do we do? Maybe we can make some pots and pans. So for the Chinese students in the audience, so if you are finishing up uh, with your degrees, I, I would urge you to go home right away to catch the very last wave of uh, the uh, eco economical boom. It's not going to last forever. So, so don't travel to other European countries, and that's a waste of time. <laughs> Just go home and work. <laughs> All right, and that's the last uh, project I'd like to uh, uh, to present. It's a very important one. It's the one for ourselves, for architects. It's the one about architectural culture. It's the one about representation. So rap is for representation. As we all know, uh, we uh, uh, draw. You know, use a pencil or a computer is another matter, but we, we do draw. We make models. Often that is really not adequate to make design decisions. So in our office, since we have a yard, and so we, we actually make lots of mock-ups. So we, we, we uh, make uh, material samples and so on. And last year, we had an opportunity to have an exhibition in uh, uh, Woolens Center for Contemporary Art in Beijing. So we decided not to only exhibit the results, the products of um, you know, our office, but we like to, to really exhibit the working process of uh, in Atelier FCJZ. So the uh, uh, exhibition is called Materialism, and, and for obvious reasons, because we, we are very much interested in, in materials, also hands-on uh, uh, working uh, processes and and it uh, was designed in such a way i'll show you in a couple of uh, uh, slides so it's it's called materialism this is a poster design and then this is uh, the uh, ucca uh, in uh, factory 798 which i think uh, a lot of you should be pretty familiar with this is our new uh, facade design for ucca there are cards so when they close it so you see the wheels, and then the cars would move this way and to close the door when you open, and these cars can, can be uh, moved uh, to uh, one side, and then you can see the, the name of uh, the institution. And this is a lobby. We're showing one of our earlier installation for the museum uh, in London, Victoria and Albert Museum. And then uh, there are six parts to this uh, uh, exhibition addressing different issues. Uh, so as you can see here. Uh, and then we, we uh, built uh, as through this door, you will see. This is the uh, sliding um, folding swing door. It's a combination of the moves of uh, uh, three uh, conventional doors in one. It's also something we did before. So there are six blocks. So there's an idea uh, of the city also suggested by the exhibition. But each one here, I just want to talk about the experiments using a different construction process. This is rammed earth using plywood as the formwork. Here also is rammed earth using different uh, color the uh, earth so that uh, you can create this uh, layer cake effect. The formwork is glass, so the surface would be very smooth. And here is concrete using PVC tubes.
for the formwork. And then here also is concrete using rubber as the formwork so that the, uh, uh, the concrete with a stretch rubber having these uh, big valleys. And then here is a plaster using a sliding uh, formwork. And another plaster casting using bamboo formwork on, on the top. So here are some of the details. Glass formwork for ram earth and the sliding formwork for uh, um, uh, plaster. So basically the exhibition as you can see are these different construction processes plus of course projects we did before uh, you know, using models and drawings. So models and drawings and actual construction and so on together would help us to create a sense of what architecture is really about. It is about the tangible world. So tangibility for us, especially for me, I guess, it really is the heart of architecture. It is not uh, you know, about cyber or uh, virtual space, but something physical of course, something uh, material. So there's a detail of it um, for, again, the sliding formwork. So there are other installations of projects we are working on or we did before. So you see the uh, fiberglass house mock-up in the back. And this is a, an installation for Seoul Design Festival in Korea a few years ago using traditional tiles, making a very light porous, uh, uh, open rather, uh, arch. So, and then you can see uh, uh, the kind of urban quality we're trying to achieve. So, here you're looking at the clothes uh, we uh, designed. We had a, a fashion show at the uh, uh, opening of our exhibition. All the models um, are uh, architects from uh, our office. So if, uh, just in case, if uh, you, you want to uh, come to uh, Beijing and work in our office, so you have to be prepared. You have to walk the walk uh, once in a while. So let me show a movie just to entertain you. So. This is that's pretty, uh, uh, not a terribly good quality, but just give you an idea uh, of, of uh, the range of things we have been doing.
uh, just to f finish up uh, this topic as well as the, uh, the lecture, um, I'd like to show you a, a very short movie. Uh, because as you know, today uh, we have more um, media on our hand, of course, than ever before. So uh, our office did a, a very short movie and to really discuss the relationship between architecture and light. And, and uh, in Chinese, they call it shadow, catching shadow. Because it's in Chinese, it's enjoying. It sounds a lot like uh, the English word enjoying. So, so please enjoy this uh, little movie. It's a Kung Fu story, by the way. If I could have summarized the five projects in one, I think it's still the cultural project. We're trying to see where contemporary Chinese culture is going. So thank you very much. Have a good Friday tomorrow.